Greetings, my friends. I am Dr. Gracie Pozo Christi from the Catholic Association, and this is Conversations with Consequences. If you're listening on the radio, you're listening on Guadalupe Radio Network. And if you're not listening on the radio, you're listening to our podcast. So please subscribe, and the um, link will be at the bottom of our podcast page. Today I'm joined, today I'm in studio, I'm in D.C. on a beautiful day. I can see the Capitol from where I'm sitting, very pretty. And I'm in studio with my colleague and good friend, Andrea picciotti Bayer. She's the legal eager, legal eagle for the Catholic Association. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Gracie. It's I, nice to see you here again. Yes, it's nice. Uh, well, it's always good to see you. It's always good to be also with our legal advisor. She's the one who keeps us straight on all our legal issues, which are very... Uh, they're always coming up because at the Catholic Association, we think a lot about religious liberty. And of course, all these are struggles that are taking place in the courts, in the court of public opinion, and then in the local courts, and then and all the way up to the Supreme Court. So we're all, all involved in that struggle together. Today, talking about struggles, um, we are going to be <laughs> talking to a good friend of ours and her sister, who we're happy to be making friends with. Mary Rice Hassan will be joining us, and she and her sister, Teresa Farnan, will be talking about their new book. Not, well, not so new. It's been out for a few months. It's a little new to me because I finished reading it this morning, and it's absolutely fabulous. It's called Get Out Now, and it's about public schools, what's going on with public education in the United States, why we should be concerned. And I was... I. I enjoyed very much. I kind of devoured the book. Uh, and and I think I mentioned to you, Gracie, before I, I carried around my big mom purse for uh, about two weeks to all the different activities that my kids have, to track meets, to volleyball games. I was paying attention to my children, clearly. But when there was that lull in between the 400 and the 800, I was working through the chapters. And I had a, a pencil and a pen or whatever I could find. Sometimes it was like a lipstick to underline and <laughs> highlight and star. And it's amazing the number of people who were looking over my shoulder and reading as I was reading and the conversations that were started. Uh, I think a lot of parents are concerned about what to do uh, as far as educating their children and um, what our role is. Yeah, well, we have a wonderful resource now in, uh, in this book. And welcome, Mary. The, our, our friends are here with us in studio. Welcome, Mary Hassan. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Wait, let me introduce you a little bit before I get to your, your beautiful sister. So Mary Rice Hassan is the Cato Byrne Fellow in Catholic Studies at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. She also directs the Catholic Women's Forum, which is a network of Catholic professional women and scholars seeking to amplify the voice of Catholic women in support of human dignity, authentic freedom, and Catholic social teaching. I can't think of anything better, Mary. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know you do a lot of good work, I happen to know. Um, and we have your sister here, Teresa Farnan. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So Teresa currently teaches at St. Paul Seminary in Pittsburgh, and she previously taught philosophy at Franciscan University of Steubenville. She also served as a consultant to the USCCB Committee on Laity Marriage, Family, Life, and Youth, and I like this, you are a master catechist for the Diocese of Pittsburgh. I do. I have a unique perspective, I think, because I not only operate in the realm of academia, but I'm, I am with the people who are boots on the ground, so to speak. So I hear the concerns of youth ministers and DREs, and that was one of the things that inspired us writing this book. Yeah, because a lot of the children that, you, that go through, well, most of the, all the children that go through CCD, right, at, at the parish level are being, uh, well, they're in, they're in public school. And Correct. They're, experiencing what you tell us about in the book. That's you exactly know, Gracie, right. the other thing that we all have in common is we're moms, and moms of many. I think we get into almost how many? 10, 20, 28. I'm doing mental math. Do we're <laughs> almost... <laughs> Do we get to 30? Apparently I went to public school. <laughs> we, have, we have many children that are dear to our hearts and their futures and their presence their present is something that I think we're all concerned about. Yeah, and and um, even the, well, my children are in have been in private school, but I also teach CCD. I have t I have taught CCD, 
and 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 also I we can talk about this maybe at the end after we talk about public school but I have found when I was reading the book about things that are going on in public school I found that I'm I'm watching the same thing going on in parochial schools and not because they're doing it on purpose but it just bleeds over from from the public yeah I think um the culture has such an influence on all of our kids. And as moms, we care about that. And, and so that really was part of our motivation as we were digging into just what, the cult, what was going on in the culture and, and the challenges for families. We were struck by the influence of schools in particular, that that really shapes our children's hearts and, and minds. And so we dug into it just to, because we felt parents ought to know. So the great majority, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into your book now. Mm-hmm. It's called... Get Out Now. It's a very strong title. <laughs> we didn't shy away from anything. <laughs> I like strong titles. I think you, it needs to jump off the shelf at you, right? So it's called Get Out Now, and you, um, you, you go through the fact, well, you, you explain, first of all, that most American children are in public schools and that the public schools are training up our children to think a certain way, and we are getting certain results at the end of these uh, these 12 years of education or 15 years of education. And you mentioned, I think you, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you break it down into sort of three big issues that our children are growing, are graduating from school without a real love and appreciation for America, for the True. United States mm-hmm. as a special uh, place. True, Special Absolutely. country. Mm-hmm. Uh, also that they're, they are graduating as practical atheists. Mm-hmm. And the third, that uh, transgender ideology has is sort of like this has created this watershed moment in public education. And and um, but you know what? Let me let let me let you explain it, Mary. <laughs> yeah. So I think the first thing to realize is most kids go through public school, and so it has been in the past one of those formative experiences that. Uh, has has in some ways brought people together. But what we're seeing is that the public school of today is not the same public school of that perhaps people in, in the parental generation went through or even the public school that they sent their older kids to, that things have radically shifted in the past, particularly the past five years. And that's where, you know, you can worry about academics you can, and, and the faith issue is a big one. Um, but for us, the game changer that we saw in people's lives is the gender issue. And you, and you say in the book that these, act, so talking about transgender ideology and why it's a watershed in public education, you say these activists regard opposition to their agenda as morally equivalent to opposition to racial equality. They would no more compromise with us than they would compromise with segregationists. That, that sentence really struck me as far as the power of this ideology. Yeah, absolutely true. And, um, and what we're seeing is, um, in terms of the way policies are being written in school districts, there is no dissent that is allowed because transgenderism is being pushed in under anti-bullying policies. And you're not allowed to be a bully ever in any school situation, in public schools, private schools. So when parents come and they want to opt their kids out of transgender ideology and some of the more offensive lessons, they're told they can't because you can't opt out of an anti-bullying lesson. And I think that is one of the things that parents don't seem to realize. Yeah, but I think an important part of that, too, is it's not just teaching kids to be nice. We know how to do that, mm-hmm. right? And, and nobody wants kids to be bullied. But the problem is what, what happens is the anti-bullying programs become a gateway to talk about the transgender ideology and to change the understanding of who we are as persons. And that's the real problem. They introduce definitions. They, they teach kids that they have to um, affirm things that are not true. You know, Mary and Teresa, um, I'm a product of public education, and that is in no way a reflection of my inability to do mental math. Um, <laughs> I did receive a, a tender and loving uh, experience. And when I started reading your book, I thought, them be fighting words. You know, how Mm -hmm. dare you Mm -hmm. kind of present the idea that public education is is something that we need to just turn our backs on? And I personally send my kids to parochial schools and and to religious schools as uh, an interest in forming them in the faith, but I love public education. And I got to admit, when I got to the end of the book, you convinced me. It's still hard, and it's it's a very big pill to try to swallow. Um, But I think you write it from the place of moms who care, of uh, serious scholars 
and, and I, gosh, a third of the book is citations, um, but really is a way for people to kind of understand what's happened. And I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about how people have responded to your premise that it's better to leave now and not give up. So so let me say two things at the outset. I think we, we want to stress that there are a lot of good people in public schools, great teachers, great administrators, great families, and great kids. The problem is the teachers and administrators in the public schools today wear a straitjacket. So they are not free, if they're people of faith, to be people of faith in the public school. They're not free to express a viewpoint about which activities are moral or not. So that's one thing to realize, that we're not condemning people who are in the public school community. There are many wonderful people there. And that comes through in your book, Mary. That's, mm-hmm. that's very, mm-hmm. very clear in your book. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I would say is that, that parents know their kids best. And so what we're trying to do is to bring forward information that we think every parent should know and that they are not being told by their public school systems or they may not realize. And so we want to bring this information forward and let parents make the best choice for their children. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, you know, we really tried to be careful because uh, there are so many, so many good people of faith teaching in public education. Um, for me, one of the watershed moments was after the Pine Richland court case in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where um, several students sued for the right to be able to use. They were ma- biologically male, and they sued for the right to be able to use the bathroom of their the desired desired sex. Right, so they wanted to use the girls bathroom girls facilities Um, and Pine Richland had tried to take a stand and said you can use a private bathroom you know we're going to try to try to walk that fine line and be kind to you but preserve the modesty and safety of girls and um, it went to court and they lost and after the school district lost and after the victory for these transgender students their attorney stood gave an interview to the newspaper and he said he was representing lambda legal and he said this needs to be a message to every single school district get in line or we're coming after you you know in in your book i some of the parts that i found one part that i found very moving was the way you explained how girls especially young women young girls feel when male when biological males are brought into their private and safe spaces like the bathrooms and the locker rooms and it it really moved me because well for lots of reasons but I have a little my youngest girl just turned 12 and she's now you know becoming a woman as (laughs) as has happened to all of us (laughs) with all its drawbacks at that age you know I I can you you can all sympathize and I she's so private she's so um, modest right now she's so overwhelmed by the changes in her body I can't imagine that Having, her having to share at that private space with a biologic boy. And unfortunately, her feelings don't count. Because, uh, that's the point. That's the point, yeah, Mary. They, they, and more than that, what the courts are starting to say are things like, you shouldn't feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. That is words, wrong, uh, wrong of them. Right, because mm-hmm. we want our kids to pay attention to those instincts, especially girls. Isn't mm-hmm. that what, what we've been trying mm-hmm. to teach them in order to be safe? And so this overrides it for the sake of the feelings of confused children. Yeah, well, you know, you, you're you're bringing up, but maybe we can talk about this after the break. That that uh, how we're intersecting now with, you know, we we want women to feel safe. We want women to, you know, this whole Me Too movement of women feeling abused, and at the same time, we're not being respectful of their privacy. Mary and Teresa, I was really struck um, in one part of the book. You s- speak about the bigot label, and as a civil rights lawyer, I'm very attuned to. Um, kind of vulnerable groups and people who have faced real discrimination, right? Um, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, and the kind of creep of these good and positive legal protections into something that's very fluid, very confusing. And I wonder if you could maybe explain a little bit more. What do you mean by the bigot label? But you know, but Andrea, we're gonna have to wait till after the break because we really have to stop for a moment, but we will come right back for that answer.
Welcome back to Conversations with Consequences. I'm Dr. Gracie Pozo Christi of the Catholic Association, and I'm in studio with my colleague Andrea Picciotti Bayer, our legal eagle. There, I got it right that time. And we're also in studio with two authors of a new book, a wonderful book called Get Out Now about the public school system. Mary Rice Hassan and Teresa Farnan are here with us in studio. And right before the break, um, Andrea asked a very wonderful question, but she's going to have to re-ask it because I've forgotten, so I imagine our listeners have forgotten. <laughs> so the, the, the issue that was raised in, in your book, Mary and Teresa, is um, the bigot label. And, and that's if anyone opposes the notion of gender ideology, they must be bigots. And I was wondering if you could explain a little bit of that and help us understand why we're not bigots if we're concerned. Yeah, so a couple of things to realize. One, um, no one wants to be called a bigot. No one wants to be a bigot. And yet this is what our children are facing in the schools because the transgender agenda is not just about being nice. We all want to do that. It's not about treating people with dignity and respect. We all want to do that. It asks something more. It asks every person to affirm this idea that if a person's born male, they can become female and that all they have to do is say that, and then we have to treat them that way with pronouns and names and allowing them into facilities. And so this idea, this bigot label, which is really a horrible thing, to be a bigot is a horrible okay. thing, Terrible. but it's, it's thrown around uh, and, and stuck on people who simply disagree, who, who look at the human person and say, no, we're made male and female, and, and science tells us that. So it's a very intolerant viewpoint but the thing I would ask parents to consider is this. You know, as, as adults, we would not want to be in the workplace and have someone accuse us of being a bigot because we stand up for marriage or for the fact that of sexual difference that we're created male or female. So how is it that we expect our kids to stand up in school and to risk? And the stories I've heard, they really put themselves on the line and suffer consequences for affirming what is simply true, that we're made male or female, and you can't, the little boy sitting next to you one day, uh, can't walk in the next day and say, I'm a girl, and, and everyone else needs to affirm that. Mm -hmm. That's something that's very apparent in your book, the way the children who are experiencing these things find themselves completely, uh, completely at the mercy of, of general opinion and, and unable. And you make it very clear. I mean, how do you... There's a part where a, uh, I think a principal changes, to come, you know, changes their pronoun and comes. One day he's a, a, a one. It's a woman, right? It's a woman mm -hmm. principal, and then comes the next day with a male name and even wants a new weird pronoun, which I can't remember what it was. It's something I had never heard of. Mix. Oh, MX? mix. Yeah, that's like a, an MX. I'm not instead sure what that of means. Mr. or Ms. Mix. Okay. Mix, yeah. But anyway, I can. Uh, you made the point in the book. How could it? How could a child in that school? go up against the principal and call him, her, Miss Anna, which was her name before, I think, Mrs. Anna. Right, so even if the parents are teaching them the truth about the person at home, in school they have to go and act as if they mm -hmm. accept another idea, which is really a lie. And, and I think we fail to appreciate how widespread this is. So school districts around us, one of the things they'll do is they'll do a day of silence or a day of pink in solidarity for LGBT um, persons who have been victims and um, or they'll post rainbows on the locker and uh, people are encouraged to be allies and I think we fail to appreciate how hard it is for a kid to be the only one not wearing pink for example or to be the only one who doesn't have a rainbow on their locker um, so that would be one point I would make and the other point too is that um, the some of these kids are coming to school and as part of their um, gender transition, they get a 504 letter of medical necessity that requires accommodations. And the school, no matter how the administrators feel about it, they are compelled to provide these administrations. Teachers are compelled to use the pronouns as medically necessary for the child's mental and physical and emotional well-being. And so that creates a situation where the school can legally, I think, feels like they can't tolerate any child who fails to affirm because then that then they risk run the risk of running afoul of the 504 plan I remember having a, a conversation about this with my dad who's just a 
really great guy, and he said, you know, how big of a deal is this? There's going to be a handful of people who are going to think that they need to transition to a different um, gender. How big of a deal is this? And reading your book, it seems like even if the numbers of people that are struggling with gender confusion are low, the net is being thrown very wide. Right, and, and that's by design. The, the prevailing philosophy is that any kid might be LGBTQ. So you have to create an inclusive environment that assumes that any child might come out, and therefore any child has, or every child, has to be schooled in the language and the distinctions and gender identity and gender expression. And they are part of the school culture, which now celebrates this whole um, movement, but this whole vision of a person. So a kid can't opt out of that, even if you opt out of opt them out of a lesson. They are they are marinating in a culture that's affirming a different view of a person, regardless of whether there's one child who identifies as transgender or none. And do you think it's overly suggestive? I mean, could there can be? I, can I quote from the book <laughs> that I, I I made notes as I was as I was reading, and I this is this is wonderful. This is to the point, and it made a lot of sense to me. Adolescents are just beginning to understand the meaning of their own bodies, navigate the changes of puberty, and pick their way through, social, through the social minefields of youth. Imagine dealing with the physical changes of puberty and feeling compelled to sort out distinct sexual, emotional, and romantic identities, discover your gender identity, and choose a preferred gender expression all at the same time. And actually, I would, I would note, too, that what we're seeing now is that in school districts that have been all in on gender transgenderism for a number of years, the number of young people who are identifying as LGBTQ are, is rising. So one poll recently in California had as many as 27 percent. That makes complete sense to me. I've, I've ra- so far now, I've, my fifth child is going through, is starting puberty, and it is a time of self-questioning, a lot of self-doubt, and they're doing... Young people do a lot. Of, they look around, and they're looking for role models and, and reasons for things. Mm-hmm. And what a terrible time to throw all these options at them. Yeah, and, and one, of the, um, one of the identities that's uh, on the rise is the idea of being non-binary. In other words, that a child doesn't feel comfortable conforming to stereotypes. And that's, that's an insidious part of this. You know, feminism was supposed to free us from stereotypical views of, of male and female. And by stereotypes, I mean the clothes you wear, whether you like trucks or, or dolls or whatever. And yet that's being used to help kids understand who they are. In other words, if you're a girl who likes to play football with the boys, well, maybe you're really a boy. And, and so this is all being encouraged and put in front of the kids as, as possibilities. You're so right, Mary. Um, we, were be, we were trying to get away from stereotypes, right? A yeah, woman, a woman right. could have it's it all. all. She, could go out and get, <laughs> she could go get the bacon, and she could come and fix mm-hmm. the truck. Mm-hmm. And now if she's fixing the truck, she must be a mistaken. Mm-hmm. She must be mistaken right. about her essential self, which yes. that's, that's quite a thing to be mistaken about, right? right. Yeah, Andrea, you, know, you mentioned um, being a civil rights lawyer, and I, I want to raise two points that I think are important. One, there's an issue of compelled speech here that our children and the teachers, when they go in and, and there's an LGBTQ inclusive environment, our kids are expected to speak that language. They're expected to use those pronouns. They're expected to affirm. In other words, they're being compelled, whether or not in their hearts they know that there's really just male and female and they don't buy into this, they have to speak as if it were true. So so there's that issue. And then the second issue that, that I think should concern all parents is that part of this ideology is, is the idea that parents aren't necessarily a safe place mm-hmm. for kids who are going to identify oh, yeah. like this. No, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so the schools have feel they have a right to be gatekeepers and to keep uh, parents in the dark. In the book, you explain that uh, in, in a way, no, and not in a way, but in a very definite, in a very definite way, the, the, this, the progressive ideology of, I mean, the transgender ideology sets up the parents as oppositions, natural op- opposers to their young children's uh, natural inclinations. What a terrible thing to set up the children against their parents. And, and when, I, when I speak on this issue many times, depending on which part of the country I'm speaking in, I will um, pull up the, the policies of some of the local school districts and just read to the parents from the school district's gender identity policy, which inevitably stipulates that the school and the student get together and decide who's allowed to know, including the parents. And they will send home correspondence 
to the parents using the legal name while calling the child the preferred name and using the desired gender pronouns mm -hmm. in school. So the parents are kept in the dark about that. I was, I was really struck when we go back if we go back to the basics, we, you know, and especially as Catholics, we know parents are the primary educators of their children, and we look to schools to support us in that role. Um, and, and even if you're not a, a Catholic or a person of faith, your relationship with the school is always, we've always thought about it as being collaborative, right? We're involved in the PTA, or we're the room mother, and we're showing up to the different activities. It's baffling to me that parents could be completely shut out of something so important as a child's kind of struggle with their own understanding of their sexuality and, and their identity. Yeah, I, I think part of it is this culture of, of experts. In other words, the, the experts on reproductive health know better whether your child should be on birth control because we've already seen that in the public schools. They can, they can provide kids with contraceptives. Same thing, the, the gender experts know better than parents, supposedly. That's, that's the line of thinking, and it, it is really problematic because it's, one, it's not right, it's not true, um, but it teaches kids that their own, own parents can't be trusted. Well, one thing that, that you make clear in the book is that it's a vicious cycle, right? The, so the family structure is breaking down uh, exponentially worse every year. So there's more and more reliance on the public schools as a one-stop shop for everything, Med, uh, all day, all day care, breakfast, lunch, even dinner, and now medical care. Mm -hmm. And the parents, and, and as the public schools become a bigger center of the children's lives, the parents are more and more marginalized. So it's a cycle, right? right. Yeah, it is. The other thing I would add is that, that um, there are a lot of diligent public school parents who have been working very hard to identify problems in the curriculum, or in a, a sex ed program, things that, that they're concerned about their kids being exposed to. And the problem is the schools are not listening to the parents. They are beholden to the activist groups because just like Teresa mm -hmm. said, they're worried about a, a lawsuit from you know Lambda Legal on behalf of one student. And they're also driven by the, you know, the activists and the unions and the progressive agenda that has is really, that's, that's who the schools um, are listening to, let unfortunately. Me, let let me bring something up that you bring up in your book, is that the, th these protocols that are being set up in, in every single school in the country, basically, I'm sure, I'm not sure anybody mm -hmm. can escape from this, they are very well-funded. These are big groups. You mentioned Gender Spectrum, the Human Rights Campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, who is funding, because you've talked about this in the book, and I was, I was shocked, who is funding Who's pumping all these millions of dollars, billions of dollars probably, into these campaigns to, to change the way our children think about the world and reality? Yeah, there's, some, uh, there's about 10 um, significant foundations that are responsible for this. And some of them have ties directly to the LGBTQ movement. In other words, there's a personal investment. Some of the tech billionaires who have come out and, and have great sympathies for this are, are driving this. But also the foundations that have typically funded left-wing causes are all in on education. And, and I think this is what parents need to sit up and take notice about. Education forms the hearts and minds of our kids. And that's the next generation of our country. And so it's not surprising that people with an agenda are really trying to, to, um, to own that space. Mm -hmm. Well, so obviously transgender ideology is, like we said, a tra um, this watershed moment, right? Because of the association with bigotry and how any dissent is completely impossible. Uh, but also, we, you, you mentioned, you, you talk about two other very important things. One of them is very important to me. Well, everything's very important to me, but this one, this one strikes a chord because I'm, I came to the United States. I was born here, actually moved away and came, came here as a 12-year-old, English as a second language student and everything. And I, I think as, 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 the child, uh, as a child of immigrants, as children of immigrants often feel, America is the most amazing place on earth. I know, I, growing up, I knew people who'd been taken away and tortured in jails. That was like a common experience in my life, knowing, talking to people who'd been tortured. So for me, the United States is this shining, that shining city on a hill that of, of myth. And, and I, that's how I've experienced it all my life, as a, as a fabulous place. And I know that my children are not learning that in school, even if my, my children have been in private or parochial school. The books that they read, in general, have very dark visions, uh, a very dark idea of the American experience and the American 
history. Right, exactly. And that was, this This is in a way um, a long time coming. Let me give you a little bit of history. The, um, the sort of the grandfather of education in the United States was a man named John Dewey, and he was very influential in public education. And um, uh, he was very progressive. And in the wake of the First World War, he really, you know, in his heart felt like the problem was patriotism. And so he was pushing towards a more globalized agenda and globalized vision of the person in the public schools. And that took a long time to develop in the teacher's college because you still had a lot of teachers who were coming from a more local setting and who just bled red, white, and blue. But at some point in the 1960s when we started, you know, you started having a lot of progressive politics in academia and in teachers' colleges, most of the teachers who are who teach in public schools have been educated and have come out of a pipeline where they focus on America as the aggressor and America as the colonial power. And so the vision of the United States that's presented is a vision where we are the problem. We are the oppressors. And they, they try to deconstruct history and study it from the perspective of all the people that we have oppressed. And the problem with that is that traditionally public schools have been the, sort of the mechanism whereby we knit the, we were able to assimilate people who immigrated into the country. And mm -hmm. so they were, in a sense, the glue that held the society together. And that was, that was their most important civic function. In addition to teaching kids to read and write, there was this enormous pride in them and a sense that public schools, first and foremost, make students good citizens. But that has changed now. And really, when you talk about civics in public education, what they're doing is they're tra training kids to be activists. They are not training them in good citizenship. How do we know that? Because they don't know the basics of how our constitutional republic works. And in addition to not knowing the basics, you can see the lessons where it's, it's all about activism. In other words, if you're, if you're studying something about um, rights, then the kids are expected to go and demonstrate that they understand this and to take a cause and advocate. And, and so it, it's an advocacy activist model instead of an appreciation of, of history and, and the unique founding of our country. And do you think that's contributing to the polarization oh, that absolutely. we see everywhere? Yes, absolutely, no question. And and I also think it's it's extremely unfair to children who immigrate to the country because we have a lot to offer them and there is, you know, a really um, just so much so much possibility and so much hope in our country, but if we encourage children to just see themselves as victims, whether it's victims of microaggression, victims of, you know, um, you know, this colonial, long-standing victims of American colonialism, where are they going to find the energy and the desire to make their way in society and make a positive contribution? They're going to always feel like they're on the margins. So it does a disservice both to our country because we are losing the opportunity to tap into some of these amazing young people who are in our public schools and it does a disservice to the young people who are in public ed public schools right now. I mean, it's creating a generation, well, generations, right, of angry young Americans, angry Americans who right. see, who see a, a oppression everywhere and aggression everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's a terrible, that's a terrible way to live as feeling as a victim. I've yeah. never felt like a victim myself. Yeah, and it, it <laughs> also creates, a, it, it, it contributes to a climate where people getting back to the civil rights angle where people can feel like they can they have to police their speech very carefully because there are so many victim cultures I mean intersectionality is just the the whole philosophy of intersectionality where you you do have, you do have very I'm sorry to interrupt but you do a great explanation of intersectionality in the book it was very helpful to me because that is a very com it's a very confusing subject when you sort of live in real life and not right. in the world of that's talking that way. Right. So what intersectionality basically is, is you um, take people who have all different, you know, facets of victimhood hood, and you rank them based on whether or not, you know, which, which victim categories you fall into. And the more victim categories you fall into, the more you have you know, you have a right to claim that everybody else needs to defer to you, right? So, um, so for instance, um, for proponents of intersectionality, probably the most oppressed person they would say would be, you know, a young, uh, young girl who is either black or Hispanic or some other minority. And so, you know, in, when you talk to, or read things that proponents of intersectionality have written, they're always talking about young girls, young women of color. But actually, if you look at the statistics, 
um, young boys who are uh, minority or who are from a disadvantaged socioeconomic background are far more at risk mm -hmm. and far more likely to drop out of the educational system. So we really do people a disservice by focusing on that. Mary, um, just because we're kind of coming towards the end of our conversation, I, I was wondering if you could give us basically a little direction. Moms that are listening, dads too that are listening, what do we do? What do we do now? And yeah. what, what, what do we do in the long game? What's our long game? I say first you have to educate yourself. You have to be aware and you have to know. You can't, can't run on sort of last year's understanding of what, what the situation is in the public schools. So that's why we put a lot of information in our, in our books. But then I think you have to really look at your child. Well, no one wants the public school system to crash on its own because there are some kids who will never escape that. You have, you're responsible for your child, and there's no do-overs on childhood. And every education has a cost. For some, it's, it's the time. For example, if you choose to homeschool, for some, it's the money to pay uh, for a private or parochial education. But we have to ask ourselves, what is the cost of sending our kids to a public school? And these days, I worry that the cost is the stability of our children's self-understanding of who they are, and it's their faith, it's their love of country. Those are deep, deep costs. So, uh, you know, I think parents need to step back and just simply look and make the decision that's best for your child. And having made that decision, if it's to pull your kids out of school, you will find solutions. And, and we strongly encourage pastors and and. Um, civic leaders and our politicians to really create options for families so that everyone isn't stuck with just the lockstep agenda that's currently in the public schools. As, as Catholics, as Catholics, I think it's th this is, even if our children are in parochial school or our children are grown, I think it's very important to read this book and understand as Catholics what we are providing. We are providing in our parochial schools and our religious schools an alternative to this poison that's being fed to our children in public school, to American children in public school. I think it's important that we keep those options open, available, and affordable. You know, and where I live, uh, parochial school uh, prices are going up every year. Yeah. And they're adding on, like at my school, <laughs> I hope my, my parish priest isn't listening, but they're adding on like a, like a gym. <laughs> <laughs> they're adding on a gym like a, with a cover and everything. And, and I keep asking, but why? Why, you know, let's keep the tuition down because there's people that really need to get their kids out of the, out of the local public school and right. put their kids in parochial school. And, and I would add, this is everyone's responsibility it is. because this affects everybody. This affects our culture. Well, it's been wonderful to have you here. I hope that all our listeners... Uh, can buy the book. You can buy it online, digitally. You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at your local bookstore. It's called Get Out Now, and we'll have a link so that you can buy it direct from the publisher at the bottom of our podcast page. Thank you again, Mary Hassan. Thank you. And Teresa Farnan for Thank joining you. us today in the studio. It was wonderful spending time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Every morning, the Catholic Association reviews all the latest news and sends our subscribers a carefully curated collection of the most important news of the day. Items are specifically selected for a smart Catholic audience. Don't let the world take you by surprise. Subscribe to our daily media roundup at thecatholicassociation.org.
You can find the links to these articles on the podcast show notes. To subscribe to the podcast and the media clips, go to thecatholicassociation.org. This week, as is customary, Father Roger Landry gives us a short but brilliant homily on this coming Sunday's Gospel. Please stay tuned for Father Landry, and do look up his daily homily, written and audio, on his website, catholicpreaching.com. Thank you to Father Landry for another wonderful homily to preview the gospel of this Sunday. And Andrea, we were very, um, I think we were very privileged to spend an hour with Mary Hassan and, and Teresa Farnan and, and their book, listening to them about their book, Get Out Now. Um, and I, you know, I was talking to them, I was thinking a lot about the fact that where I am in Miami, Basically, everybody I know in Miami is, has just arrived. They've just arrived from some horrible hot spot. Nowadays, it's Venezuela. We're full of Venezuelans. And I keep having these conversations with Venezuelan parents saying their children, of course, have to go to public school because they have nothing. They have no, no money at all. And they're just trying to make it uh, from day to day. And uh, they're just so confused and terrified about what their children are telling them when they come home from public school. So it's it's really great to have this book as a, as a resource. I'm going to have to start handing it out to my friends in Miami. I, I agree, Gracie. Um, 
it was a great discussion. The here I am outside of DC where most of the people aren't coming with nothing. They have an abundance. And they still are looking towards their public schools as being full of opportunities and richness. And they don't want to leave that. But I think, as Mary mentioned in our conversation, it's about where your priorities are. Um, preserving faith, their sense of identity, and their ability to kind of speak freely is something definitely that us as parents, we need to be supporting and encouraging. And this book, I would highly recommend, like you said, to everyone we know, read it. These are hard hard decisions. You know, and let's not forget patriotism. That's that's a virtue yeah. that we can't lose in our country. It's, it unites us. It, it knits us all together and in, in bonds of brotherhood. That well, can... And just like you were saying, Gracie, I had I lived out of the country for a long time, too. This is a wonderful place to live. <laughs> this is a wonderful place. And we thank you, our listeners of the Catholic the Catholic Association of Conversations with Consequences. Please join us again next week. Subscribe to our podcast. And thank you. <laughs>